Hello, everyone. Welcome to the PFCP meeting on October 15th, 2024, in progress. And without further ado, um, I'll, I just wanted to jump in that basically the real revolution that's needed is not so much like um, around uh, the rights to use, you know, what do we do with the rights to data? Is it open source? Do people... You know, could people have like private data sources that they hoard or monetize or whatever? The real revolution is way, way deeper. And I think we all agree to this, but I just wanted to articulate it, which is a revolution in our identity as a species. You know, are we a bunch of individuals in competition with each other or are we like a giant ant colony, colony where we're all working together? Um, and, uh, I, I, I subscribe to the ant colony model, but we've, but it's like our software, our, our culture, our programming has gotten us. And this is combined with the modality of hyper-capitalism, um, and hoarding, uh, and individuality. We, we're, we're, we're playing the wrong game. It's like, we've all gotten downloaded with this malware, right? This software virus that, you know, has us all believing that we're separate and that other people are our competitors and, um, you know, we're competing for scarce resources. And if you run out of money, you starve and all these terrible things that have come with hyper-capitalism. So anyway, just wanted to interject that. And uh, so great to be with you all. Passing the feather. I wanted to take up the feather. That's okay. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking instead of saying feather, we should have a vegan version of it, like passing the bread or, you know, water, something like that. What do you think? Well, I, I, I personally don't find passing the feather anti-vegan. And I, I put forth an experience after someone protested rather vigorously about using that passing the feather. I mean, birds naturally molt and loose feathers and why not you know use those feathers i i the thing that really brought it full full fully to me was after this this vigorous protest against using a feather a bird i was out walking a bird flew fluttered in front of my face and then flew away and and left a feather floating down to the ground at my feet right after this interaction where where they were protesting th that speech and uh it was you know pretty uh pretty powerful to me that there's there's nothing wrong with using that because a bird actually passed the feather to me all right well anyway we're getting way off track here we we, we were on a really I'm good so conversation sorry. so let's let's get back <laughs> on it but use use whatever metaphor analogy you want okay passing the feather okay cool well i for one i'm curious to hear jamin i know this is not directly relevant to um coin the planet but maybe we can tie it in um, I'd be curious to hear how you would define hyper-capitalism. Yeah, so um, think of, so capitalism is something that I think emerged very slowly. And if you if you think about it as kind of like a spectrum, um, maybe go back, you know, 5,000 years ago, whenever people started using gold coins for certain things, at that time, the vast majority of life was still communal. There might have been certain things that were, you know, bartered for on trade routes or whatever. Um, so I think it's something that kind of crept in, kind of like how uh, totalitarian agriculture, which is another good uh, parallel analogy, totalitarian agriculture crept in. First, we were hunter gatherers. We didn't plant or harvest anything that wasn't already there in the forest or in the grasslands or fields or whatever ecosystems, you know. Um, 
And then little by little, we started, oh, if we throw our seeds over here in this kind of, you know, nutrient rich spot of land, then we can reliably harvest, you know, fruit from there again. And that, be, but that was supplemental. So it all, it started in the fringes. Agriculture started in the fringes. Capitalism started in the fringes. And, but again, the vast majority of life was still communal. You know, somebody hunted a deer they brought it back to the, you know, to the village and everybody ate, right? There was no, oh, hey, I got a deer. You want to buy a pound of meat off me? No, there was none of that. Same with, you know, nuts, seeds, whatever was harvested. It was, you know, as, as hunter-gatherers. So agriculture started on the fringe and now, you know, barely anyone goes out and hunts or gathers anymore. It's all, you know, commodities, Grain is traded, meat is traded, it's fruit, produce, everything is traded for money. Um, <clears throat> likewise, capitalism generally, um, if in communal life, life was communal, and then someone started, you know, mining gold or saving seashells from the beach or whatever, and that those started to be traded for certain things. So it started on the fringes. So hyper capitalism is no more communal. Right. Um, and it just everything is just bought and sold. Everything has a price. If you have no money, no food for you, no shelter for you, no nothing for you. It's that that's hyper capitalism and runaway hoarding. Right. So, again, the people who like if someone was was strong enough, nimble enough to go out and hunt a, a deer and then they bring it back, that was shared with everyone. So there used to be um, this, you know, whoever had a surplus would share it, right? And um, and so between communalism, I won't say communism, but because that's totally different, communalism and hypercapitalism, those are the two bookends. And then you can have anywhere in between. And so... Uh, the Scandinavian countries of Europe are socialist economies. So there's a there's a safety net. They're sharing. Nobody goes hungry. Um, I, I don't I don't think there's too much houselessness, et cetera. So that's you know that's many would argue that's a sweet spot. These are thriving. You know the Scandinavian economies are thriving economies, and people and people are taken care of. Sorry, are you talking to me, sweetheart? You said, but they have five taxes. Yeah, but they have really high taxes, you know, so that's what puts them in the middle between those two bookends. So, you know, something like, you know, uh, I don't know, Hong Kong, Singapore would be like hyper capitalist, I would imagine, um, not being a student of those economies. But anyway, that's a short answer to the to the question, passing the feather. Yeah, it's well, it's interesting. I was thinking while you're <clears throat> describing this that um it's kind of like we're 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 always trying to quantify more and more and more and the reality is that there's always an unquantifiable element or there's um as some would put it unpriced externalities and um the, the cost of change to the climate is a very good example of that because um, we are, you know, collectively still in the process of basically um, putting the cost of the actual um, cost of the environment on the, uh, the relevant corporations. Um, and, you know, w one of the biggest general solutions to that is um you know something like a, a a carbon tax is an example um and i think it's interesting because the more i well i i think from from my perspective i'm not saying that um i'm not saying that I'm not trying to uh, downplay the potential for disaster in regards to climate. Um, but I think that AI is also a very 
serious threat at the moment. And in some ways, it's a bigger threat to our humanity in the sense that um, it is rapidly and will rapidly take away uh, quite a lot of, I'll just say, power from people. Um, and maybe I would say, well, more importantly than that is, uh, is meaning. I think it, it threatens, um, the meaning of people's lives. Um, if AI is, is replacing people, if AI replaces people, um, and so I think even though it is a kind of utopian perspective to think about this AI um, developing to a point where um, humans are, are not needed for a lot of these intellectual tasks for a lot of these um, tasks in quantifying, quantifying more and more and more in this hyper-capitalistic uh, sense um ai is increasingly more and going to be more responsible for doing that that quantification of things which kind of brings into question what what the humans are responsible for and i would say um to kind of try to tie it back to the to the problem of cooling the planet um is the humans are the connectors that we're the ones who are actually building the ai um, we're the ones who actually have to get together and collaborate to solve the problems at the end of the day and make the decision about or decisions about um, how to address our problems. Um, AI can be an enormous, is already and will be progressively more so an enormous tool um, and uh, an enormous aid. Um, but it does come down to humans as i think it it should it should come down to humans um and i don't know i think it takes i think there's quite a bit of of mental gymnastics i want to say that we have to do as this technology um continues to be developed there's there's quite a bit put into question in a very short amount of time. And uh, yes, we have, we have AI now to help us assess our new situation. Um, but, uh, but I think the call really is to get back to our humanity because um, there, there's, you know, if if we're all just competing and fighting with one another and wreaking havoc on the planet and causing destruction, I mean, that that's not giving AI good reasons to be on our side. Um, so we kind of we have to figure out how to play the new game, um, uh, with our new with our new ally. I will say, if I'm talk, talk, speaking of AI, um, uh, generally as a as a kind of uh, uh, single AI, not that that's really what it is going to be, but that's kind of my personally one of my bigger fears is the um, that concentration into a singular intelligence. But um, and with with that, I, I will pass the feather. I've been speaking quite a bit here. Well, I believe like um, like. Regards to AI, you know we said, but um, I believe anyway. At the end of the day, even going back to the days beyond before gold, I mean, salt was the trade. You know, Roman soldiers were paid in salt. You know what I mean? Right before gold became uh, the trading thing, so there was always trade. There's always those that have it and those that didn't, and there was always poor then as well as the, and and wealthy then as well in those societies as well. Even so, you know that all that did was that um. That a whole behavior just magnified as Jim and said, and it's and then it's gotten into instead of having an individual 
like king or leader or ruler, we, we have these corporate entities now. So they're a complete entity of groups and corporations. And between them and between lining the pockets of politicians or what have you, they, they've managed to really sow the situation up, even legal, legal, legally wise and everything, to cover their asses in a lot of ways, like for them to continuously just plunder the earth, basically. So, and with, with regards to the economy, that's not even something we should vote, because that's what I'm saying, that's not even something we should even be worried about at the moment, because that behaviour will always go on until some final situation arises where humanity comes to its senses and realises that we got to stop what we're doing here and deal with the main problem, which is the global warming issue anyway, because, um, you know, all else is mute. But the, you know... I'm losing my point now, but the wars and everything else like that are happening and everything else. Maybe something like that's going to have to, you know, unfortunately, some mad incident is going to happen anyway that's going to shake the shit out of people. Like it's going to, you know, with what's going on either between Ukraine now and Russia or between the Middle East. Some bad event is going to happen, I believe, anyway, my own heart and soul, and the way it's been escalated and pushed that some bad event is going to happen. But maybe it'll be a bad enough event to shake people out of their, uh, you know, shake people to their senses and realise, like, we got to stop this madness. Like, we got to really, you know, well, where are we going as a species? Are we going, are we devolving or evolving? Like, you know what I mean? So I think, unfortunately, sometimes it does. As I said, I've said that many times. It takes for the roof to be, or the sky to be falling before people take notice sometimes. And, um, yeah. It's, it's as hard as that may be for I hate I hope that something like that doesn't have to be drastically that it has to happen for that to happen but in the meantime I believe like that's why I don't believe we should waste our time talking about economies or things like that I think we should talk about the essence of just bringing people together in the sense of make you know in order to especially those who are awake to the madness that's going on and the and the sensible the sensibility of of coming together as one new human family, so to speak, and just building on that alone as an example. You see, I always I'm always standing over my teach by example. You learn by example. You teach by example, and the best thing we could do as a united people who are you know against all this madness is to unite, connect more, and unite and stand together as an example in opposition to the madness that's going on because we must remember like that it's the majority of the people in the in all of europe and the middle east the majority of the you know civilian populations they don't want that madness going on in their countries at all like you know what i mean it's the leaders that are running them into that like so until we get some kind of an event that's going to shake the, shake us into our senses and realize that we need now to all stand together and just tell our politicians, OK, time for you guys to go and time for those policies to change. We need to start looking after our planet and ourselves like, or we're all doomed very shortly. Like if we don't, either by war or by global warming, one or the other anyway. But that's what it's coming down to, I think, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Are you are you complete there, James? Oh, sorry, passing the bread or the bun or the feather. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'll pick it up. Um, you know what this this uh, thinking back to what Jamin said about how you know it, when we were in in smaller villages, and you know people went out and did whatever it was they did, uh, hunting or fishing or or basket weaving or whatever, and and you had your skill, and in you know, you can only make so many baskets for your own use. And then when you have more, you, you share, uh, you know, and that's, that's that villager and that village was really not really so much led as it was cooperatively managed. You know, then we, we, we started to organize ourselves in a way where we created empires that were, you know, led by an emperor. And, and then we, we've had, you know, kingdoms and they were led by kings. And now we've evolved to this place where we have so many countries and they're led by, well, I think you get the, get the picture there. Emperors, 
empire led by emperors, kingdoms led by kings, countries led by <laughs> long girls. Well, it starts with a C. King, kingdom, empire, emperor, country. Ka, yeah, okay. Maybe I'm stretching her a little bit. Uh, what we need to do is get back to to you know a, a sharing mentality where there's where, where we're not counting so much on a leader to lead large groups of people because that seems to be quite a failing proposition. Uh, if we look at the condition of the world now, as we 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 delegate responsibility to a few people, uh, it's it's not working very well. And I think part of the answer is more, uh, you know, along the line of decentralizing or just smaller communities uh, that, and then finding a way to organize them in, in a way that's not giving great power to a small number of people, but just sharing responsibility and power. And with that, I pass it over. All right, I'll I'll pick it up. Um, now the thing is to get to the sharing mentality um, is at this point like taking someone with leprosy and saying, "How do we get that person to health?" Right? We're really far gone down the path of hoarding, hypercapitalism, the raping of the planet. Um, monetization of everything down to the last mahogany tree, etc. Um, I believe that to get to the sharing mentality, which we can do, but it's going to take collective human intelligence to get there. And the sharing mentality is going to be part of a total transformation of society and of our species, our culture, our politics, our economics, everything. And only the brilliance of collective human intelligence or collective human super intelligence or CHISI, as we talk about, CHSI, it's going to take that to get us there because the transformation is going to be so huge and there's going to be so much resistance on the part of those who are attached to having great wealth, great power, great influence. You know, whether it's Bill Gates or Jeffrey Epstein, oh, oops. They were uh, roommates there on on Epstein's island, right? And so look at how the you know the uh, the billionaires converge on on that sort of thing that all this abuse of this tremendous abuse of power that knows no bounds. So it's going to take a really radical transformation. So the, for me, the the real question is how do we get to Chizzy? Everything else for me at this point is is kind of water cooler talk. The, what we should, what I think we should be focusing on is how do we get to Chizzy? And as I wrote about in the email today and recorded in the video earlier, you know, we're we're having we're we're broadening the conversation. We started with PFCP, but now <clears throat> we're broadening it to how do we get to Chizzy? And, you know, we've talked and in the email today and in the video, I talked about kindred spirits and Operation Welcome Home. A few weeks ago, we were talking about calendars and snack bars, but I think we need to go much deeper. Kindred spirits enables us to go way deeper. So does Operation Welcome Home. And with that, I pass the feather. And by the way, I'm happy to play a 17 minute video about Operation Welcome Home if anyone wants to see and uh, I think we're all pretty well versed on kindred spirits at this point. But if not, we can also play uh, play some a, a five minute video on that. Um, but anyway, I'm passing the feather. I'm trying to be really concise here. Uh, what was it that you were talking about? Um, the term Operation you were Welcome. using. Operation Welcome Home or kindred spirits or Chizzy. That one. Chizzy, Chizzy. Okay, Chizzy is an acronym. I'll put it in the chat. C H S I, which stands for Collective Human Super Intelligence. 
Heart Space is in the waiting room. Marco, do you know Heart Space? Yep, that's Brett. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. Well, this is a perfect conversation for Brett. So let's all give a warm welcome. Brett, welcome. You know, Brett, we've been having a really cool conversation up until now. And with you here, now, now it's, it's perfect. Perfect. <laughs> I love it. Hey, how you doing there, Brett? Yeah, going with the flow, man. How how is everyone? We're good. We're good. We're we're deep in a conversation about collective human super intelligence or chizzy, or at least that's the conversation I'd like to be deep in. And uh Brett, since we've it sounds like you've been having some cool conversations lately about networks of conversations, feel free to enlighten us. And then we can enlighten each other. Is this a good moment for you to give a little brain dump on that? Or do you want to just go with the flow here for a bit? What's your what's your pleasure? Let me ask a question first. Is everyone here in this call right at this very moment familiar with the chizzy conversation in that it won't like are we talking about like the high level or can we talk get really deep because everyone's familiar like so is it like is everyone here a newbie or, or are we all like on the same page where we could like yeah i think we're i think we're all basically on the same page um uh, for those who are who need a, a, a one a 60 second refresher so just imagine this conversation and then imagine an unbounded network of networks of conversations like this one, but spanning all topics that matter. And we all know the topics that matter, everything from cooling the planet to feeding everyone to going vegan to political transformation to cultural transformation, et cetera. So imagine this network of networks of conversations that is hyper-connected and self-identifies as one whole network of networks of transformational conversations. And the analogy is then like lobes of the brain that each have a bunch of neurons in them. That's like a network of networks. Each lobe is a network and the brain itself is a network of networks. And within each network, there's conversations or like neurons, except instead of firing with just, you know, a, a unidimensional signal, either strong or weak or somewhere in between, these conversations can fire with whole ideas, whole designs, whole plans, whole theses, whole concepts, etc. And so... Collective human superintelligence or CHISI, the network of networks of transformational conversations, is um, like a planetary brain, very much like a planetary brain with, you know, thousands of different lobes, right? Each working on different parts of the overall problem. What's the overall problem? Saving, healing, and transforming life on Earth, including transforming ourselves. So that's the 60 second refresher that became a 120 second refresher. <laughs> and with that, I pass the feather. Brett, take it away. Um, so <clears throat> I've mentioned my friend Nico before, who's a socio technologist. He's working on a project called Coasis. He's the founder, it's a legal DAO. It would be C O A S Y S dot org. And on that page is a link for something called the Synergy Engine. When you go look at the Synergy, we should actually bring it up here. Does anyone have an easy access to sharing screen shares and doing a search on Google? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, spell, spell it again. I'm going to put it in the chat. All right. Oh, okay. Cool. Make it easier. Yeah. Um, and then you'll know why I'm referring to that, plus it'll help me contextualize it. So that's a piece of the puzzle in the ecosystem. Um, I also had someone else the other day, who is it, talk about conversation? Oh, um, a, 
couple new friends of mine want to have this thing called golden connections where you have a conversations and everyone shares like the one connection they're like looking for that would make a shift for them or a difference for them, whether it's information, resources, whatever, inspiration. But generally they were talking about conversation of, you know, a whole network of these conversations in a very niche way, let's say, because that's their passion compared to maybe multiple types of conversations. But really it's the same template and it's the same format and as many conversations as we can possibly have really in that I call it a stone synergy soup instead of a stone soup. So the way I see the conversation of conversations is that there's all these ingredients going into a stone synergy soup. And that big bowl is kind of like the symbol for me of the container for all those conversations like boiling and whatever. And there's a lot of nice imagery there um, in many ways. And the stone soup parable is very nice too. Um, so with regards to that, um, because of some of my technology connections, I'm often thinking of like, how do we actually create like the technologies and platforms and how do we scale that conversation and conversations up really? And how do we like receive people and how do we, how are we going to do it? How are we going to index things and how are we going to, what's the interface going to look like? Um, I mean, that's not something I want to think about all the time, but I can't help that I know all the people that have these pieces. So I should say it's more of my job to help orchestrate those pieces and help orchestrate conversations more than it is to actually build that platform. Like, Jamin, you've got the energy, you know, to be a product developer, let's say, <laughs> of this platform. Like, you, it came through you, only you. There's something called work with source. I'm going to put another link in here, and I'm going to ask Marco okay, to the, also the, the one you put in there, I, I'm getting site can't be reached. Is there misspelling? Uh, um, try, like, the HTTP kind of thing or something, you know? I'm able like, to it. Is it the Coasis one? Yeah. Yeah, I can reach it. Let's see. So anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit now or later about this idea of work with source. This is a guy named Peter Koenig who did social research with entrepreneurs and founders, like all this evidence-based research, because he wanted to know like how founding of companies and initiatives work. And in his research, he basically determined no matter how many people think they've co-founded something, really, there's only always one person who is the source of any initiative. And he kind of defines it in a very simple layman's way of who is the first person to put skin in the game. Now, in his model, you have two ways of helping a source. You have other people who come along who sort of just support it, like they help out in a way or they, they're kind of outsourced, you know, to help in a way. And sometimes people bring a piece to the source puzzle that is a source themselves. So for instance, like while I see Jamin as the source of the conversation, when we co-create and I might say, well, I'd like to have the conversation broadcast on my Fractal Impact Entertainment channel, right? I want to turn all those conversations into the most fascinating TV that's ever existed. So when choices are being made about how that platform goes and the name of it and how it rolls out, I'm the source of that, even though it's performing a function in the ecosystem that Jamin is also a part of it, but he's the source of, so using that idea, let's say um, lightly, it's not like it doesn't have to be like with a hammer, but generally that archetypal sort of pattern I found is very important when it comes to creative people, people who have destinies and purposes because things come through us for a reason and they're not meant to always be shared so openly like where everyone has a decision because it's not their it's not their baby to raise. So like they can help raise the baby in different ways. But I think that's an important point. So Brittany, are you able to, we just see a blank screen. Were you able to, oh, there you go. <clears throat> oh, that's the work with source. See if you can go to the Coasis one first, please, if you don't mind. All right, now scroll down and look for the part that says Synergy Engine. I've shared this with Jamin, but it's nice to have it on video here. So it'll it'll be there somewhere. It's also too technical right now, the website for normal people. Here, you can click on uh, more on the Synergy Engine. And Nico just said something to me the other day where he was more specific talking about conversations. But let's just read this out. Discover the... Don't watch the video because I think... Let's just see this. Discover the Synergy Engine... A privacy preserving distributed search platform empowers you sense make by requesting specific data from others. Is it all right? Go down a little bit more. 
So this is about the indexing, right? You define what you want and how you get it. So this is going to partially be a backend technology. Keep going. Keep going. So this is explaining basically you're doing a different kind of search than you used to in the past because the network is providing the data. Like the nodes in the conversations are the ones who are responding. When you say like, where can I stay in Sydney? Instead of going to Airbnb, which is like a centralized platform, your request to stay in Sydney goes out to the network, like a mycelial network. And everybody starts saying, well, I think I know someone here and someone's offering this. And all those people become part of like the chain that brought you what you were looking for. So everyone is basically participating in the collective intelligence. That's a very layman's high level. So scroll down a little more. I think there's like a sentence or two that I think is interesting. Let's see this. Uh, each query is accompanied by a social stack. That's what I was talking about now. That maps each query's journey across the network, Jamin. So I'm sure you can start seeing, right? You can map a query journey across the network. So now across the conversation to conversations, you can see how we can get very specific in connecting people to the conversations they want to be a part of, really down to super minutia as well as high level. Um, and then there's a token related to that where everybody gets rewarded by being part of the synergy being created there. So scroll down a little bit more. I'm just wondering if there's a, one more. No, keep going. <clears throat> one more. Let's see. Oh, wait, maybe it's this. Yes, you see semantic analysis, transcribe calls, synergize and connect, flexible, flexibility across data form. This is the one. It says talk, right? Actually, if you scroll back up a tiny bit. Yeah, see, yeah. talk your way into a wise web. Um, <clears throat> so this was the the actual thing I was looking for. As just one example for all of you, you don't have to understand all of the jargon or anything, but I think you can, if you just put those pieces together, right? Look at the little subcategories and I welcome everyone to go check that out um, on their own uh, if they'd like. And someday we'll get Nico to drop by also and talk more about it. Expanding conversational frontiers, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I'm so I'm just trying to be quick. I'm sorry. I know it's a lot of information and stuff, but I thought it was just get it into your consciousness and let you guys do the rest rather than make a 40 minute presentation or something. So and if you if you don't mind just going to the work with source. This is a very short website. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen of how much wisdom and knowledge is in just like these five pages on the left side. How do they start the sourcing the initiative, the role of money? These are like five paragraph pages that are unbelievable. And then the links to further reading have a bunch of articles by this guy named Tom Nixon, who is someone who's carried on the legacy of this work called Work with Source. The original source materials came from this guy, Peter Koenig, that he references here. Exactly. Um, and then there's some other links here to Tom Nixon, who's written some really important articles on decentralized, non-hierarchical, like social gathering. Um, so this is just a really nice resource. I recommend everyone kind of just looking through this and reading through that work with source materials to get a sense of for yourself why that might be a nice understanding to have uh, in general and also empowers people to bring their creative gifts to the world without always, again, being in a space where now everyone on a call is trying to agree on something that maybe they don't even know what that I find that a lot, especially in our our communities. Like I go into a call, I say I'm doing this, and the next thing I know, everyone wants to have a vote, and they have no idea, like how my project works, or like the ins and outs of it. It's like, you know, you wouldn't ask a plumber to fly your plane. So there's something to be said for stewardship and and source, you know, creativity of something. Like we, it's not about ego; it's about like literally responsibility. Um, so you can stop the screen share now. Thank you so much um, <clears throat> for doing that. Yeah, th thank you, Brett. That was that was awesome. Aside from those two pieces, I'm weaving all these like other people and things in the background. And on a personal note, I had the most glorious conversation today. So I have a project Jamin and Marco have heard about called Togetherland that's sort of always in prototype potential mode. And I said to my friend a couple of weeks ago, like, I'm launching this. Like, it's not a big platform yet it's not like a finished film or whatever but i'm fuck it like this thing is launched and i decided i wanted to start my documentary which is a part of it because it's many pieces that go into my my platform you would say or my vision like films and documentaries and tv shows and technologies and conversations like anything in the world that is a useful way 
of engaging and creating art or economics. They're all mediums to me. So my production is what I call transmedium, not transmedia, because economics is actually a medium for exchanging value. Like justice is a medium for sovereignty. You know, education is a medium for learning. Uh, science is a medium for investigating the natural world. Like expanding what techne means, like the etymology of it um, is important to me. And I'm into synergy and co-creation. So everything I do is about the synergy and co-creation. So my project in a sense is what I call the reality production. There's no other way to name it. I'm literally trying to create a rap reality like we all say we are. Like I want to have a different experience of the world. And I'm not saying I'm gonna do that by creating an internet platform or new medicine. I love all those things, but my job is to actually create the actual like new reality to some degree, like maybe directing and acting and producing. I see it more of it like reality as a movie. So I'm always acting, directing, writing, producing, and then I'm a philanthropist. So everything I do is out of the love of humanity. So those are my key things, writing, directing, acting, producing, and philanthropist. Um, so in that regard, I have to use many different mediums and the pillars are music, and film and TV because story, story is everything to me. To me, the universe is not made of quarks or electrons or souls, it's actually made of stories. Um, and to bring it all back around, Jamin, when I heard you talking at the beginning, there's a famous saying that the neurons that fire together wire together. And I was like, actually, it's the stories that fire together that wire together. And really that's what I hear you talking about when you talk, it's, it's bigger than a global brain. It's bigger than that. It's a social body. It's an external reflection of wholeness and co-creation and a, like a soul that is collectively stewarded by all of us, yet owned by none, but also represents us and it's nonviolent and all these things. That's what I understand us to really be aiming for. A collective brain is part of a, a body, like you were saying, the lobes, but there's also like a collective liver and a collective lung and all these other ways of looking at it to really go out to like, you know, Bucky Fuller, Bucky Fuller called it Spaceship Earth. And I've basically rebranded Bucky's work from Spaceship Earth to the UFO, which is unnameable universal united fractal organism. So Bucky was close, but he was still looking at Earth like a spaceship, like mechanistically, you might say, and using those words, like his idea was much grander than mechanisms and all that. But if you just look at the language, it was spaceship earth. And like, I'm saying, no, this is even more alive than we imagine, right? And it's coming from the spiritual plane, you might say of energetics and all that. So for me, yeah, earth and the whole existence is a UFO, uh, which is a lot of fun to say, like that we have real disclosure um, compared to the disclosure and all the conspiracy um, realms. Like we can actually have a press conference, Jamin, disclosing the together ufo and people will think we're talking about aliens obviously but we'll be talking about us um so that's going to be a lot of fun in terms of your of your your darth vader and um all of your marketing genius i really wanted to have this press conference um possibly out of cairo on the rooftop of one of our locations as well um where we actually announce the disclosure of the ufo the existential prize like spiritual philanthropy co-creation the conversation of conversations the synergy engine and i just bring everybody on stage to give like their two like you did jamin right that time when everyone was doing it i just want to take it to the next level and like get it on tv more and like get it into like a little bit next level not mainstream because they're not ready but i want to reach the tentacles a yeah. little bit farther out to like web three and like meta modern and the real change agents on the planet and the climate change activists, those people will all get it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's me in not a nutshell. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, how would, how would Darth Vader be received in Cairo, like at Terrier square, like singing Spanish love songs, performing? I mean, would I get beheaded? Would the police tolerate it? Um, would people be fascinated? Um, I would have to ask Mona. I don't think you would get I don't think you would get arrested in terms of like going to jail for six months. They might come over and say you can't do that or something. You know, I don't know that. I have a feeling they wouldn't like really arrest you, arrest you. But I actually don't know. Like I would have to. Yeah, it's more important that you're clothed and you're a man probably more than anything. And if you're weird and singing songs, I think you're allowed to do that in public. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But we have experts there who live there and know the culture. So that's not a problem we can find out. Yeah. Problem, okay. 
probably about the same response you got over in Scotland when all, all the police were arresting the Extinction Rebellion members around us, but they were coming over standing for photographs with you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because this gets back to Brett's principle about music. Music, it just it melts the heart. It brings people together. It makes people happy. And since I sing from the heart, I think it might be kind of interesting. And the fact that I'm a gringo, you know, in, in Cairo, um, I, I think could be uh, uh, very appealing. And then, you know, that could sort of be like, you know, the opener and, you know, essentially the village fool uh, for the press conference, right? Um, but the press conference would be the it, that would be this, the, the intellectual and, um, you know, cognitive substance that we'd be bringing to, to Cairo. Um, but anyway, no, but I, I really like your thinking, Brad, because, you know, if we do the, a press conference live in person, um, especially with Cairo's recent um, uh, legacy with Tahrir Square 2011, Arab Spring and all that. I mean, Cairo became the the world capital of the Arab Spring. So I think I think Cairo would really embrace it. Passing the feather. Yeah, I'm. A, I just want to comment on what you were saying, Brett, about you know, bucket. I'm launching it. It's that's a there. There's a like a been a been a shift in a planetary frequency and an energy where that's. In, in numerous groups that I'm in where people are saying, Hey, we've talked and we've talked and we talked. It's time to do something. We're, we're, we're all getting, I, I've been feeling it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready to, to, you know, last few months I, I'm working towards, you know, doing something physical on the ground, you know, making the change that we talk about. So it's, it's not just you and, and, I think that's amazing because so many people are feeling it and, and getting there. So we're, we're on the verge of, of the new paradigm very much, I believe. And thanks for your sharing today. And with that, I pass it over. Mm. So I feel if we want to make changes to get something done, uh, then we're going to need to just how I see it and what has worked for me so far is just helping others out with uh, what they need because then it's going to just free them up to be able to tackle the bigger problems uh, collectively. So if everyone has, you know, their finances taken care of, whatever's on their mind taken care of, any other distractions of their everyday life taken care of, then their time is freed up and then they're able to um, work together collaboratively by if everyone is like held back for their own personal life, then it's not easy to, you know, synergize and <laughs> merge together to work as a team. Um, yeah. And with that, I'll, I'll pass, I guess I'll pass the, <laughs> the feather then. I'll use feather. It's okay. And, and what you, I'll, I'll grab it for a sec. What you just said there, uh, Brittany, is very consistent with what Mark McCormick has been saying for quite some time um, with his ideas of the ever living meeting and everything he's been promoting. Um, so, anyway, I just wanted to make that connection. Speaking of neurons that fire together, passing the feather. I'll just comment on a oh, Suzanne, did you want to share anything? I should ask maybe. You're on mute, Suzanne. It's, keep on talking. So I'll just comment on a couple of things. One, Marco, I agree that a lot of people are starting to turn towards this sense of what people call doing something. Um, and that's the key reason I brought up this work with source. Because if we keep trying to, in my opinion, according to my experience, if we keep trying to self-organize and co-create it from the same level of consciousness that's created the disorganization and fragmentation, like 
we're going to keep being in a circular sort of experience where everyone wants to do something and then nothing sort of gets done. Now, for me, that is because we have not, most people have not upgraded their actual like operating system and understanding of how to socially organize in a decentralized yet unified way, which is like a holy grail. So the existential rebellion got sort of close, but then they fell down because they tried to use holacracy, in my opinion, which was a nice start, but it's over, it's not fun, first of all, which is a big problem in our space. Like if things are not fun, you've got a problem, <laughs> number one. And number two, it's what is called green and spiral dynamics. And I guess I won't go into a whole dissertation, but if anyone's interested and is not familiar, look up spiral dynamics on a high level Actually, I have a document I can share here. I made for someone else. Spiral dynamics includes many things, but one feature of it, like one aspect of it is what's called green, the green mean. And it's about different worldviews of different categories of people. And when you guys read what this says about the green mean, so Brittany knows, when you guys read what I send here in this document, you're going to be like, oh, this is why we're having so much trouble as a social organism actually getting to the action because it's really challenging no one on the planet has ever done what we're trying to do which is organized for peace like those who organize for war right just to keep it simple and keep it reality like if we don't that's the action i think when everyone says we need to do stuff like we all want to do stuff like we all understand like we need to kind of be united and if we try if we take away people's agency and their creativity and try to make everyone the same and everyone has the same vote and everyone is just one like that shit doesn't work i don't know if anyone's paying attention humans come to earth in my opinion to be creative to to realize like a legacy their true self whatever and it's different for everybody and until we can like really honor and celebrate each person's different gifts and what they came here to do and then weave those together in the stone synergies too then there's no resistance and there's no my project, your project, there's no nothing. And then the collective intelligence in that space, in that space of wholeness that Brittany was alluding to, is really what allows us to sort of amp up the game and create more islands of coherence, as the famous saying goes, and to connect those islands of coherence, which are really neurons and you know individuals firing together, wire together. So I just want to say one more thing, which is I agree with you uh, that it would be optimal if we could basically give a version of a UBI and healing of different types to everyone who wants to kind of be a part of that uprising, because it is important for people to have the spaciousness and the safety and the excitement to actually be able to find their best gift and find their best fits and not have all those stresses. So my project really is founded on, like I told you, philanthropy. So everything I do comes from the idea of how can we support everybody? Like how can we magnetize resources and how can we generate our own resources? Um, I've spent too much time not doing that. And I can't even afford to go take my wife for a little vacation or go somewhere with her when my visa runs out. So really that's not wholeness, right? That's not me having what I need. And everybody on the planet has a version of that. So radical new philanthropy is sort of baked into the thing that I launched two weeks ago. And it's really designed for what Brittany described. Like, of course, it needs to scale up. Of course, the first 10 people will start, will benefit first and then 20. And then together, we have to keep raising the stakes of more resources, more ideas, more revenue streams, whatever. And then we... We can, I think we can make it happen pretty quick um, once the ball gets rolling, but it, it, it takes like a tipping point a little bit. And I'm hoping that what we're all doing together is the tipping point because the only way through the eye of the needle is what I call co-creation. Because we're all geniuses. There's plenty of geniuses on the planet, by the way. And there's plenty of money on the planet, by the way, obviously. It's not the problem. The problem, as my friend says, is that we have a problem of implementation. And I think he was right. Like we have a problem on this planet of implementation and obviously getting over polarizing conversations, but that's what I mean about respecting each other's gifts. Like you have to find some way to peacefully coexist, I think, um, you know, before you can even maybe get onto the finer things. So Mark, if you don't mind, hit no thanks.
And then go up top to that search button, I guess. It's probably that one. Um, type in uh, UFO. Oh, no. Type in Stone Synergy Suit. And then I'm dropping the feather. Thank you. Yeah, there it is. So, Jamin, most of the stuff, by the way, for all of you, I recommend checking out my Substack. It's basically mostly free. If you sign up, like I, I appreciate, you know, contributions and paid, but it's all mostly free. Uh, Jamin, you need to go, and most of these articles are short. I did it on purpose. There's a lot of content here, but it's kind of like an encyclopedia, Brett. Um, it's got all these different pieces that you can read really quickly as food for thought. And for me, it's basically, you're reading like a Nostradamus. So what I'm predicting won't happen exactly because nothing ever happens exactly as one person envisions it. But the gist of what I'm talking about, I would bet my life and give 100% like money back guarantee that a, a version of what I'm talking about and the story and world I'm creating is what our future holds. Just because I'm a time traveler because of my background, like with mental health and being so far out of the matrix and being so depressed and like suicidal that it gave me an edge <laughs> because I literally stepped outside of the what we know and I started observing it, like as an anthropologist, you would say. Um, so there was a lot of pain in that because I felt outcasted, like like the hero's journey, but it also gave me a great perspective. Um, so Jamin, make sure you read this because this relates to the press conference. Um, and the main announcement at the press conference will be the existential prize. So we're going from the extinction rebellion to the existential rebellion. And we're going from the X prize to the existential prize. And the existential prize is not something that people compete for. It's basically the treasure chest of spiritual philanthropy that gets distributed to everyone in the network so that healthy uh, stories that fire together can wire together to answer the other. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. I have to go look. I usually remember names, but Brittany, right. Yeah. So thank you for all listening. I assume if you guys were bored or I'm talking too much, you really should just raise your hands and cut me off because... Yeah, I'm just in a deep flow re re recently, so it's kind of all just really fresh for me. Yeah, it's honestly refreshing to have you here, Brett. Hugely. Yeah. Oh, so really good. There's no need to like cut you off or anything. Um, you had a lot good uh, of good to say. I was just gonna say that um, one person's project is everyone's project because it's uh, something that impacts everyone. And so if one person doesn't do it, then it falls on someone else. So eventually it needs to get done anyway. That was all I, that was all I was going to say about that. Uh, yeah, someone else could take a, the feather up. I want to know where your name comes from. Tell me about Bunk, Brittany Bunk. This is your character. I love characters. My whole gig is called Story Living. So I'm doing Story Living as a service instead of software as a service. So Story Living as a service is a double entendre. It's giving service, and it's also an actual monetizable thing. So story living as a service, we provide story and immersive world building, you might say, and gamification and all this other stuff as a way to facilitate results that we want, just like software facilitates results, like going into, you know, social networking as an application, like creating a, a Google document is an application. So we are going to have all these synergistic applications came in. So they're also known as synapses, aren't they? So now take that metaphor, synapses, synergistic applications, global brain, global soul, global communication system, global nervous system, more than a brain, to be honest. It's really a global nervous system because the, the stories that fire together wire together and we've got synergistic applications. So... We've got a basic infrastructure now, and like a lot of people's projects have been developing to a point where it's easier for them to come together, which is the most important thing. I also believe that what makes us resilient, by the way, by not forcing things and trying to work together when it's not ready to happen, and we come together organically, that actually makes it resilient. Because it just, I mean, it just clears day to me. What makes it resilient is not forcing it. What makes it resilient is going with the Tao or God or whatever way you want to say it. Like that is what will enable us to actually deliver the day of what we're all talking about because we love each other, because we allow each other to find our ways and we support each other in getting there. And eventually we make so much money that we just share as well. 
obviously Elon Musk, if he chose to be an evolutionary and spiritual philanthropist, could actually basically fund like a million people in a Manhattan Project style with all of the materials alone. He could also give them a hundred thousand a year for five years, plus he could fund all the infrastructure if he so choose to do that, which I'm not going to be down about him not doing that, but it's just an example of what you could do very quickly at scale if you happen to have a hundred billion dollars. And there's no reason, I mean, Jamie, you work for Microsoft, this is in your DNA. There's no reason that Full of It Industries can't be a unicorn billion dollar company within the next 12 months. There's absolutely no reason, especially when it starts getting valuated and then all the, we start actually having this spiritual philanthropy show and we start like challenging the richest people on the planet to come see my rocket. And my rocket's bigger than all of their rockets, right? So when we get into the pissing contest with all those guys, like they're going to be happy to basically donate a minimum 10% of their wealth because they're going to know that we are the ones they've been waiting for. And what we, what we create will also keep their family safe. So the big thing with a lot of wealthy people is they're actually scared like anyone, you know, and they're worried about making bunkers and going to Mars because we're all going to kill each other. So like, we're going to find a way to bring everyone in. This is where I almost disagree a tiny bit with you, Jamin. Like all the conversations matter, actually. Even people that like NFL football, people that like hip hop music, even people that like to complain about racism or be racist. At least if all of those conversations were in one container, we could actually see them. And without judging them, maybe we would find a way like to heal through the conversation. So I would say it's more than just climate change and, and this, it's actually any conversation of passion, really, to some degree, any conversation of interest, like on a global decentralized platform is where we'll go. The first iteration won't be that, obviously. Um, but, you know, who knows, maybe Elon will sell Tesla to Brett Minster full of it at some point, right, for a dollar. You just never know what could happen, right? I'm finished, thanks. Yeah, we've got a raised hand over here. Melissa wants to say something. Go ahead, sweetheart. Hello. <laughs> In the shadows here. <laughs> nice words, Brett. What's with the shadow wise, first of all? My wife is always in the background in the shadow. She's like my Alfred Hitchcock character who I just always talk off camera to. <laughs> There's something going on with yeah, the Hitchcock wise. It's like the Stafford wise, but it's the Hitchcock wise. Yeah. There you go. Go ahead. <laughs> it's just because I was doing something else and I was just listening in because what you were saying was kind of interesting. Um and I know you probably already know this, but I think the one thing that I haven't heard you mention um yet. Um, tonight is the process of healing that humanity is going through, right? We're we're in this process of bringing uh, trauma up and out, personal individual trauma as well as a collective trauma, and I think that's essential as the first step actually before we can do what you're talking about. And I think the big problem with this billionaires and um, like Elon Musk, is that they're addicted. And so this healing process has to help get people off the addiction of money in order to release the money. So I just wanted to add that. I hear you. I'd probably take you up on some of that, but for now, I hear you. And obviously there's a lot of truth in what you shared. I think if you go to Marco, like if you go back to my sub stack, the main first line of full of it industries says co-creation is healing. So for me, Melissa, because nothing is outside of anything else and nothing is separate, basically co-creation to me is healing because co-creation requires inside and outside. Like you can't co-creation isn't mm -hmm. about fixing the solar panels and fixing mm -hmm. the soil. Co-creation is about expanding, growing healing the inside because when we do that the outside kind of take really takes care of itself in my opinion like that's where magic really right. lives right in the in the growth in the personal growth right. in the ability to have peers around you that support that healing 
I use the word healing to mean growth more than illness, by the way. That's just my spin on it. That's I don't like the idea that there's anything wrong with us because I don't believe that's the case myself personally. I just think there's a journey of expansion and growth and that's what healing is. And the people that don't grow and expand are kind of greedy, you might say. Like they're greedy for what already exists. So they kind of can't let go and find something new is maybe how I would put it. But Mark, just do a search in the top for full of it. F-U-L-L-O-F-I-T. But anyway, most I totally I, hear you. And it, it, I, everything we do is definitely mm, part of that. So it, right. it's not left out. Right. I think, though, like this idea of co-creativity, you get it. I understand that. We're creatives and we're evolved to a certain point where we get that. Um, but I'm not sure everyone understands that. And I also want to say that healing, yes, growth, but it's also about um, processing unprocessed emotions, you know, things that came from trauma, for example. And um, I think that people need to be seen, heard, and loved. And I think that that is going to bring us to a place where we can start to co-create. And I've noticed that here in Europe, in Belgium, where Jamin and I in, are interacting, with, whether it's an Uber driver or people we pass in the street, the fact that we're seeing them and engaging in conversation with them has allowed them to bring up a lot of conversations about their traumas and their anger, for example, around colonization, because there are many North Africans here and Africans. And it's been really healing. And it allows us to come together in this beautiful, um, culturally diverseness. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, I mean, that's why I'm starting with story living. Story living allows for relational relationality and for processing anything, really, because it's your story. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's all li li literally, I mean, in terms of my Bucky Fuller obsession, this is anticipatory comprehensive design science so mm -hmm. there isn't there isn't a discipline or perspective whether masculine or feminine that hasn't been really woven into the essence of what i'm doing it may not be that i have the full piece of that because it's not my specialty but i can say the seed crystal of the vision and the implementation and the projects always is holistic and it always essentially focuses on the feminine and the intangible and the feeling first, because really, again, the one of the understandings or beliefs in the world of this is that the inside is what, and it's not really inside, but the inside, the potential, the the void, the the God, whatever, is where all appearances come from. Like all of our, everything we see outside of ourselves is like an expression of God, in my opinion. So, it's it's kind of like a basic fact that okay. feelings, and growth and and processing emotions is a, is really the fundamental starting place. I don't think we have to wait for that, though. No, I we... don't think it has to be only conversations. And I think we can monetize that, to be honest. And we can provide a platform that actually embraces doing yeah. that work together through those conversations, yeah. because some of those conversations will be people that are passionate about that. And then that will also ripple throughout yeah. that web of conversations just by osmosis at minimum as well nice yeah. yeah thank you it's just one word marco full of it f-u-l-l-o-f-i-t then industries well you type as good as i do dude <laughs> <laughs> hey welcome that's like th that's me typing dude i'm literally watching a mirror of me type it takes me like four like four minutes sometimes to just type a one word like that nice image that's, by the way. that's a hilarious thank you so, oh no, you're since you're searching the is Substack yeah, now. Oh, there because it's well, Substack is weird like that. You've now entered like this other place rather than searching my Substack. So like, oh, you, like it's I don't even know how it works. It's the one thing about Substack I don't really like. It's not easy to search. So you're now like on the create an account page, and it's like uh, rather yeah, than the Synthony Times. Yeah, click on there. You go X out and welcome Franca. Hi, Franca. With you here now. Is perfect. Yeah, we can just uh, unshare this for now anyway, Marco. We'll welcome Frank in. And... 
thank you for the welcome, even though I'm off camera and I'm only stopping by very briefly. Thank you for the welcome. Word. Um, it's funny. She says briefly, but then she hangs out for hours. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, one that's of those hangers, hangers honors. Well, she she just can't bear to break away. It just gets so interesting. Marco, you yeah. look Gandalf mm -hmm. today. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we? So how do we start? What is the starting point? So you've talked about, I, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm I know where I'm going to start. I'm going to try to convince you using the word positively. Yeah, that this is my piece of the puzzle to to know how to start it and where not to do what you do, by the way, mm -hmm. but to actually know implementation wise, like where we start. And I think where we start personally is meeting in a different platform where we can still record calls, where our friend Victor is setting up infrastructure for creating transcripts that will make it easier for indexing conversations. And the platform is even better than the breakout room structure of Zoom. Like now that platform has some limitations in terms of it costs money per user. And someday we'll either have to have like a, a tithing thing or we'll have to create our own version on the, you know, whatever. Yeah. But as far as like getting traction, Jamin, which is where I want to bring you from the last conversation, like to boil down, instead of thinking so big all the time, which I'm the most guilty person ever. So when I say that, <laughs> you know, like I'm all due respect to you and anyone, like I'm the last person that should ever say that, but I'm going to say it. Like, I want to get you down to like MVP. And I think you can prove your point by basically semi following my instructions. And then we co create it because I don't know exactly whatever. But I think I know what to do to get the next best version of what you've been doing on the block party. Even if it only means that after every block party, an AI thing goes out the next day saying, here's a summary, like, here's the links, like, here's an index, even that would be a better proof of concept than what we've had so far using just zoom and like the snack mm -hmm. calendar and then you have other pieces like i haven't told you about i'm working with a local llm company so that's large language model for people that are not into ai basically chat for anyone who's not into a chat gpt and all these things are what are called large language models they're types of ai but they're not ai ai is like a bigger topic and a bigger subject of technology and then these large language models are type of ai that are based on generative text and stuff like that and interacting with you like based on a database and searching whatever magic they do so basically most of them are run by big companies which is a problem i don't know if any of them, any of you watch the news but open ai went from open source to completely proprietary and sam the the ceo basically seems to really i don't know if he's on the right path or not i would have to say i don't know this guy but it went from a nonprofit open source thing, which I'm not always a fan of. So I'm not even saying that's a good thing. But the fact is, it started with this intention and now it's completely for profit and kind of being run by a dictator. The more important point is if you're not into the technology, and I'm not a super expert, but I can say this the people who train AI, LL, large language models, and the algorithms they use and the energy they have is way more important than the actual technology itself because they're the ones that are giving birth to this thing and they're the ones deciding what information it learns and what kind of attitude it has and how it responds. So the most important thing coming up in the world is to decentralize AI really and to have, and there's something called Singularity Net by Ben Gertzel um, and, and all that. But the most important thing is they're all open, they're all business owned. So I have friends who run something called a local large language model where you train it only on your materials. So it's it doesn't have all the information, but that's a good thing sometimes because it's not integrating like weird information. So basically all of my sub stack that you guys saw bits of what's this like world with all these principles of healing and co-creation, I'm gonna create my own AI and it's only gonna be trained on the materials that we want it to be trained on eventually. And when you become a member, Jamin, of the conversation and conversations, like, for example, one thing you can do is opt in, right, to like having your information maybe train the, the new AI based on Chizzy. Um, and that's another piece, Jamin, again, when we co-create more closely together and expand our visions, like you might as well use 
like I would say for the block party and the conversation, Victor's thing, because I'm already working with Victor and I'm already doing this. And it's like, it's kind of the most efficient thing to do, but only when it works. And I think we've reached a point now where some of us have evolved enough of our piece, even if it's just stewarding it, it may not even be like a product, but that we're very clear on what is ours to do. And we're very clear on our mission. I think it makes it a lot easier. So Jamin, we can go deeper, whether it's now or next time, or if I see or just whatever, however that works, we can get more specific. But to honestly answer your question, that's the first thing I would do. I mean, I would say like, let's start migrating over to Victor's Vibe Cafe in the room that I created because it's for co-creation. It's got my energy of like this co-creation and the story and the healing, like where Victor's container is more of like a container of containers, right? So he wants to create a like a conversation, a conversation infrastructure, by the way, Jamin. So it's already a perfect place where everyone can have their own room, just like I have. And within that room, there's many rooms. So it's all like, it's really flexible. And it's also can be gamified. And it's a really good proof of concept. It's a really good way. Yeah, I I think. That's the one on Gather? On Gather? Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, Martha, you could share the screen again later and go to the, I gave you a, a link there for synergyworks.cc. At some point, you could try that and see and do a screen share and show people how to sign up. How and do then, we Jane, get and you can decide later. How do we get into your Substack, Brett? The Substack is just uh, www. It's where I mean, maybe Marco, if you, if you're able to just put a link back into my Substack, or and then you can subscribe for free. Mostly, again, you can sign up if you want for paid, but whatever. Um, so that's how. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll show Melissa how to get into the Substack, and yeah. we'll, we'll we'll dig into it together. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing against some version. You know, Substack's a massive thing right now. Like there's people on Substack making a million a year, 500,000 a year. It's the biggest growing like creator economy, like empowering sort of modern, like mainstream platform right now. And I think it like well done, mainstream web 2.0, like well done. Mm -hmm. They've got video, like you can do video updates, like you can have paid subscribers, you can have levels of tiers of things they do take quite a good commission i'll tell you that much huh. but at the end of the day without building that damn thing myself which has proven to be too difficult i've been in these advanced technology projects like the coasis and they're so sophisticated that they'll be ready when they're ready and they're not always usable so i've also jamin going to gather town and like local llm and really the process and vision for the conversation is more which i know you know and you you would have said that anyway like until blockchain works exactly the way we want and we've got smart chain, you know, smart contract developers, blah, blah, blah. It's very difficult. So I believe the best bet is to try a new experiment in a sense with what you've been doing with a few tweaks and yeah. show people the conversation to conversation, like show it to them and show them some goodies. Like, so they start staying excited and they're like, oh, I can now see even more what you mean by the index mm -hmm. and all that. And I think we can get to that, especially this is the other benefit of the co-creation. Like now there's more hands on deck. Mm -hmm. So now I'm not having to figure everything out or create the coda or create this. It's like, I'm a one man band, like we all are. And we have to figure out how to get over that, right? Like the one man band thing is killing all of us. Yeah. yeah. Like we and have also, to continue, we've got to figure out how to be stronger together, which is the whole point. Yeah. yeah and bring all our gifts together. Like you were saying earlier, yeah. And also what's really, what I really like about your Substack is it's not just text. I think your visuals are really great. So yeah. you don't get bored, you know, and I like all the layers and stuff you got going. That works really well. And I think for your- yeah. And I'm not even, and Melissa, I'm not even like a graphic artist. It just goes to show you, my whole site to me is a proof of concept. Like when I have a team of people who I say, this is what I'm thinking. Can yeah. you create like a beautiful image or a video? It's going to go wild. Yeah. It's just that it's not actually, thank God for, if AI changed my life, <laughs> if I didn't have AI, I couldn't create a bet like this level of proof of concept. Okay. So it's been a godsend for me on writing and the imagery and everything. Yeah, it's really like, fun. A godsend. It's really mm. great. There, yeah, there it is. True Coke. So that's my headline of my company, you right? Into your story, you know, and then you want to know more and then you read. I yeah, think I mean, well. it's a, it is it's no different than Star Wars for this generation, except yeah. that it's real rather than just projected on a two D screen. Right. 
Right, but right. it is immersive, like you're saying. I again, I just don't see how humanity can get anywhere without a story because people don't care about logic. And by the way, I've told this to Mark McCormick, Jamie. I've said it a million times. He used to cry, like, why don't people care that the ice caps are melting? And my response is because people don't care about living and dying, really. Everyone knows they die at some point. What people care about is a life of their dreams. Like what people really care about is happiness. Everyone knows they're going to die. Everyone lives. That actually doesn't drive people, despite psychology Yeah. and all of our thoughts about like the fitness, you know, of evolution and, and, co and procreate. That's not actually what drives people, I don't believe. That's why we're not doing anything, because there's not yet an inspiring enough reason in Yeah. hearts and souls to actually do it. If we keep telling them four degrees are changing, the ocean's rising, logic and rationale are not the height of human evolution. They are literally use cases for certain ways of survival. It's good to be logical. Like it's good to be rational. Also, Melissa, very patriarchal and left brain. If you like, you know, Ian McGilchrist, if anyone watches his work about the left brain and the right brain, like that is where the patriarchy and the masculine energy has gone nuts. You know, and we need to bring balance back to the force, as 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 George Lucas would say. Yeah. Right, right. It's interesting because Richard Rudd was, I think it was a 36 gene key. Um, it's veneration, it's the city. I've got that one, yeah. Yeah. 32. I've got it three Oh, times 32. in my chart. That's it, 32. I've got it three times. Oh, you've That, got it that's three my times. It's Interesting. my expertise. It's my expertise. Preservation gen and failure is my shadow. So I'm used to like failing forward. I'm really good at failing. Yeah. Wow, I'm getting goosebumps. So um, what, what I thought was interesting is he talks about his research into purpose. And we've gotten so trans fixated on this idea of purpose being something we're doing, like the ego, right? We're attached. We want to be succeed, make money, whatever, whatever it is. But I thought it was beautiful. He described purpose as living, um, as having a well-lived life. And then what is that, right? I mean, I just think that's so, so perfect. You know, what kind of following on what you're saying, you know, what is a life well? I'm in love with the gene. I think I honestly, as a futurist, like literally if I worked like Ray Kurzweil in the mainstream, I would tell everyone the gene keys is literally to me, a top five technology on the planet, like right up there with like quantum computing, whatever. The gene keys is absolutely fucking mind blowing. And once we get that going into, by the way, the conversation to conversation, so people can meet based on archetype Right. and purpose is way more important than meeting on subject matter, by the way. Right. Because And again, people are still driven together by the attraction. Barbara Marks Hubbard called it suprasex, which is the, when you get aroused by your your purpose and your creativity and you're with like all of us. Like you said, Jamie, people don't want to leave. That's what Barbara called suprasex. And that is the nature of reality, in my opinion. Like life is sex. Synergy is, you could say it's a six sexual energy exchange. Yeah. Like, like, as you know, better than anyone, Melissa, what you're talking about is that. So the gene keys is... I, I mean, I just was working on one of my keys last night and it, like I finally like broke through like this understanding after contemplating this for years. So I'm literally knee deep in the gene keys right now. And I advise anyone on the planet to pick up the book. It's, it's It takes a little time and you're better off doing it with other people. Um, but don't be intimidated. Like just get the damn book, get your profile and just start reading it. That's it. Yeah, Yeah. It's amazing. Richard's amazing. yeah, 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 it really is, yeah, Yeah. He's a friend, not a great friend, but he is a friend. And he did visit us in our first Synergy Hub experiment in oh, Rotterdam cool. eight years ago. very cool, Um, so that's, again, destiny, karma, tribe. This story is bigger than logic. And as far as other people, it's not right away for mom and dad. But because it's entertainment, because I'm going to create a Disneyland the size of planet Earth that's for healing and creativity and basic income, Therefore, it will be accessible to every type of person. Yes. Yeah. And he talks about um, the if species evolving into the new human being and what is that? And that's a really interesting conversation as well that he's having at the moment, um, which I think, you know, we're all part of, right? This wave of this visioning something new. and how we relate to one another and to life and to beyond. And the other one is Michael Mead. Do you know his work, Mosaic Voices? And if you don't, everyone, I highly recommend his work because he's all about story as well.
everyone's told me to check out his stuff and I still yet have not been able to plug in, not uh, j just for whatever reason. It's one of those things. I sometimes find the things that are going to be the most meaningful to us, we end up not going into until yeah. the time to go into them is. Yeah. I had that experience. Right. Yeah. I had that experience today with something. I think it was like astrology or some book. Like I've been, oh, I, the guy I interviewed today, which I think I started the conversation with, I had an amazing first like interview today to kick off this docu-series I want to make about all this, like for real, like, and it was Roger Nelson, who's the founder of the Global Consciousness Project that started out of Princeton, that's also working with HeartMath right now. Um, so he's an old timer, he's 84. He told me all of his stories about growing up and how he went through synchronicities and all of this art he did with science and all the people he's met. It was a um, veneration galore, Melissa. It was my, I was in a dream listening to someone who lived in the 60s and 70s and went to Princeton and did these experiments and he knows this person and he knows that person and he made a weird jam and he made, him and his friends in New York had a band and they made instruments out of the strangest instruments. Like I'll get the interview up on my Substack soon. You're going to love this guy. <laughs> um, and then there was just tons of synchronicities and all that. And like, he knows this person. And I feel like from the Gene Keys perspective, I'm really in my gift groove. Like I'm really flowing lately, like by doing my personal work, by the way, the only reason I'm better today than I was last year is because I had a, I started working with a coach a few weeks ago and I really needed to look at and process some of the things I couldn't like look at and process no matter how much my wife told me or other people told me or drugs, whatever it is, like it was too much of a blind spot. Like until I could see it, I couldn't see it. And it took me saying yes to getting support by this coach because I felt comfortable with her because yeah. I don't often share myself because I'm get I'm so out there like my friend said you're the good thing about you is you're officially crazy his <laughs> friend my friend said to him well Brett's kind of crazy isn't he and he said yeah but he's officially crazy and I was like I was like yes thank you I get that that's true <laughs> I am officially crazy but there's a lot of wounding like I was taken to the mental hospital by the way several times and locked up so like my, a lot of my rejection, like self-betrayal, like I have a lot of stuff that I've, mm -hmm. I've dealt with okay, yeah. but not fully. Like, and I've yeah. been working more on that lately and trying to cry more and like, and because yeah. talking about it and chakras is not working for me. I literally just need to cry. Like I literally just need to shake it out. And, yeah. and I, I know like, I feel like that's the, honestly the quickest way for me to move on because it's a real shedding, not some abstract shedding. And I'm able to cry in movies and stuff. But when I try to cry for myself, you might say, like, I'm very romantic. I'm able to cry when I'm moved. But when it comes to, like, going inward, and I'm an Enneagram 8. I don't know if you know the Enneagram, but Enneagram 8 struggles with actual internal, like, processing because we're, like, outward looking and visionary and leadership and, like, vulnerability is sort of our Achilles heel. Um, so it's kind of baked into my archetype in some ways, too, that I would have would have had to understand this. Yeah. yeah. Well, they say that when we crack open is when the light comes out, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to I'm trying to get there. Yeah. In the process of cracking open. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And but, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. I need to crack open this wall that is around my heart, yeah. which has been a good protector to some degree, by the way, because I'm so actually sensitive and out there that like if I don't protect myself, like, you know, the the man in the van will come to get me because I'm a disruptor. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of true. There is just some true, some wisdom to protecting yourself, but I got so hurt that I, you know, overdid it. Mm -hmm. So then everything is like fight or flight. Like I'm always anxious. Yeah. Like if you look in the jinkies, if you happen to have the book, my SQ is uh, number 57, which is unease, clar intuition, clarity. Okay. And the, the SQ in the jinkies is like your hero's journey. So like the shadow in there is kind of like your kryptonite. Like you need to unlock that to go up that pearl to get to the pearl sequence, which is your prosperity you're talking about, like who you were meant to be in the world. And and your prosperity is different for everyone. It doesn't mean money all, all the time. It could be your self-expression. Right. It could be mean being a mother. Like what is it that makes you wealthy? You know, as yeah. a as a human being is what the prosperity means in the pearl sequence yeah. in the gene keys. So I've been working all of them. You do it all different times. But on a linear sense, I'm still was making my way through the Venus sequence because that's about emotions and right. relationality and your childhood and all that. And the SQ is the last stop to get to the core, which is halfway in the Venus and halfway in the Pearl sequence. So it's like a transition space.
What's your and that's where I have that's where I have one of the 32 failures. And that is your deepest wound. Oh, interesting. The core wound in the core sphere is like human what wound you're carrying that is humanity's wound compared mm -hmm. to your own right. SQ wound, which is more personal to your 21 years of like gestation and all that. So failure I take on for the whole of humanity, you might say, right. rather than even just that I'm not a good artist and I never made money. That's sort of a part of it, but really it's so deep. It's three times in my chart. Yeah. That. So what do you, what veneration is the city for that key, right? Veneration is the city for that. Yeah. yeah. So how, what's your takeaway on that? On As far as I understand veneration, the two best metaphors that came that I understand from reading it is one, it's about the great chain of being and knowing your place in the whole arc of time. So it's okay to say like, I actually am more informed and knowledgeable and creative than Da Vinci, but I'm not as a creative as King Solomon. Like just as an example, it's like knowing your role, like in this great chain of being, it's like veneration, sacredness, like yeah. the celebration of all the gifts. Yeah. That's one way of looking at it. And then the story I heard Richard tell on a video about this, is that people who preserve and take the rootstock of things and graft upon like the essential pieces. That's why I'm always making pop culture references because I find the little pieces that I believe should continue on throughout history. And then we build a new narrative and new infrastructure on top of that rootstock. And you're, I know you're into gardening. So the best thing to do is not throw everything away, but it's to find the healthy, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. And then build the new garden on top of that. So he tells the story of, the, a man who is planting trees his whole life and everyone thinks he's a failure. Mm -hmm. And then a hundred years after he dies, the place is a forest yeah. and everyone. So it's a very futuristic. You have to be like, I'm getting the chills. Like I had to come to accept that mm -hmm. as much as I want to see my work or the planet, you know, have my gifts. Like I have to at least be accepting of that. It could be a hundred years after I die for all I know, mm -hmm. like the ego part of me had to accept, like, if I'm venerating and preserving, like it may be, I'm always a hundred years ahead of my time. I don't think that's the case, but until I could at least accept, I may never win the Nobel prize. I may never get the billion dollars. Like I may never get, you know, recognized, you know, whatever for, although that's changed because there's some people in my life, like all of you and mm -hmm. some other people that I've met recently who totally see me. Yeah. So I don't need a Nobel prize, but I did need attention like I did need people to say Brett like we see you you yeah. know you're officially crazy <laughs> well, well I mean there, I know it, can I chase this thread because I think this is really interesting and it really applies to all of us but this is Brett's story and what um is coming to me is I would like to call you a collagist <laughs> you know because what I see you're able to do is you're taking uh beings and aspects and all these different things and you're able to collage them together and it's making me think of the human design you know sometimes our gates are lit up but other gates are not and it takes somebody else who has that gate that you don't have lit up to light up your gate right and and so i think you know you're really good at lighting up gates you know for for others that's going back to the collages and then the other thing that i was coming to me while I was listening to you is this incredible book I'm reading right now. It's a woman. I, I think it's a woman writer could maybe not. She channeled Mary Magdalene. And the beautiful thing in this writing is um, the, the author looks at um, before Jesus, Judas and Mary Magdalene were born um what their contracts were before they came to this earth and how, while they were in physical bodies, they came to an awareness of their higher contract with creation, with God. And so I'm just thinking about you, Brett, and how um, if we can wake up and remember our connection to this divinity, to this higher calling that we came here for, then there can be an acceptance of our roles, even if we are prostitutes or madmen or um, priests or you know whatever role we picked in a lifetime to fulfill as part of the whole cosmogony. Cosmogony, 
can't say that word very well. You know, cosmogony. Thank you. <laughs> cosmogony. Yes, it is hard to say. Cosmogony. You know, um, of humanity, if I could call it like that. It's totally synchronistically related to some of the downloads my wife's been getting. She like she keeps a dream journal for fifteen years. She's too like you, super. That's why I said there's something going on with the at least the Jamin and Brett wives club. Like, there's, <laughs> like you guys. Like there's definitely a, a a thing there, but she had a download recently about Judas. So we literally were talking about Jesus and Judas oh. today and yesterday, but we weren't bringing in the Mary Magdalene energy, which is interesting. So I'm going to go back up to her yeah. later and ask her like how that could fit in. But yeah. it's because she got specific guidance, like something, something Judas. And she's been reading the Course in Miracles, actually, which we've never, neither of us had ever actually read. Yeah. That's... And it's actually, it's knocking her over right now. Yeah. Like. Yeah, let me go grab this book because it might interest both of you. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Jamie, what do you think? Do you want to go? Do you want to do? Do we want to try a screen share and get you guys signed up for, like, gather? So if we ever wanted to meet there, you guys would just easily be able to do that. Or what's your opinion? Yeah, I'm. I'm already on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. I've, I've been there a few times. So uh, cool. So you know how to get on there then. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Here. And and I'm not at all opposed to making this great migration. Mm. um because it sounds like that's kind of where it's at um so um i think we would need some preparation um yeah you know we we all we're going to need to talk it through yeah and uh but that that might actually be uh what we might want to do and since he's got that cool broadcast bot we could kind of keep one leg yes. each puddle for a while broadcast yeah. on to zoom and say yeah. hey everybody the real party is happening over there and gather and uh it's calm i, I kind of love that i was actually thinking the same it's like it's kind of like the people that just want to witness it like a tv or a movie yeah. okay and if you actually want to get in the game it's a nice little gamification move really yeah like like you always can watch it if you so choose and here's an here's the link in the invitation to this you know right um so so yeah, so so for me, let let's at least can at least go. You should all talk about that, see what you think, and mm -hmm. let me know. And then if you're a yes, we'll just start figuring out how to do that. We'll also talk to Victor because he's footing the bill for stuff. I gave him fifty bucks last month, like to try to do something, mm -hmm. because there's like that's the only right now the massive bottleneck like mm -hmm. for Gather Town at this level, like if we were bringing in revenue and all, it wouldn't be an issue. We could pay it, whatever. It would be actually worth it for a year to pay even a thousand a month. It doesn't matter. It's like, I want to be the kind of person that figures out how to make a thousand a month. This is like my holy grail. It's like, I, it's like crazy. But, but anyway, there is that slight limitation, but I think for the first month or two, like if you're getting 10 people at a call sometimes and eight people and six people or 12 people, like, I think we can manage that. And if we need to raise it up, maybe a bunch of us could put in 10 bucks a month or something and get an extra, some extra money for Victor. So he's covered and not, you know, cause he's also running out of money, but it's not a massive it's amount totally of money. Beautiful. I think between all of us, maybe we could do help out a little bit or something. Yeah. Well, um, this is the book it's called, I remember union. Mm. And it's, um, can you turn the light on over here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's um, the story of Mary Magdalene and it's, um, I'll I'll have Jamin send you, or I can Facebook you. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, Thank you. It's very beautiful. That will be good for Andrea. I think she'd be good for her to read some feminine-based literature, like around the same yeah. stuff that she gets. Okay. Love cool. you guys. I'll see you later. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, sweetheart. Love, Love you. you. All right, well, I have to check out in like 10 minutes if you want to do a closing with me and reflections or anything. Um, I can take my time to do that, but not forever. But yeah, yeah, understood. It's later for you, Jamin, as well, even, right? It's a 1230 by you, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 1220. I mean, not that you're not used to staying up. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Friday, right? So No, no, no. But, but the thing is here, everything's shifted nine hours later. So yeah, it's so much different, right, than being on the West Coast and time-wise. <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah it's the two bookends of the western of the western world but anyway it's all right um yeah uh so for so for gather like let's let's just envision we made the jump to to gather town the jump to lights yeah. 
would we be just one of many tables or gatherings or meetings there in gather town um and you know um so so like on a typical friday how many meetings are happening there in parallel or is it typically one or two You know, I don't think it's it's not so much by day right now. Victor's basically paying some kind of level where so many people at any one time can be in any room in his whole cafe, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I have to find out if it, it how low it is, but he could easily at this point, like Fridays from X hour to X hour at minimum, if not all 24, could be again, maybe because he doesn't have to do every all his calls on Friday, like whatever, like I think there should be a way to like work that out. Either some of us put in some extra so he can increase capacity and then he does whatever he wants to do. Yeah. And then there's just enough capacity. Yeah. But in terms of synergy and unity and like proof of concept, my personal bias is like, let me do the narrative building, like strategic narrative context building. So I would, I'm recommending the first thing we do is hold the block party in my gather room called Synergy Works. Mm -hmm. because there's a narrative behind it it's a single container it's made for co-creation not the conversation and conversations but it's made for co-creation so as a transition space before you decide or figure out how many rooms you need and how much money it costs you know whatever 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 like we make synergy works the home of true co-creation the first place for the next version of let's say the block party and even these tuesday night calls from there once we have some experience and we record them and we see how it's going the conversation is going to be something like, okay, do we want different tables inside Synergy Works to start doing the conversation of conversations, right? Like literally, or do you now need a conversation of conversations room that then does whatever? And really, we don't need to, I don't believe we need to answer that now. And I think if I were to put on like the crystal ball, I think the conversation of conversation could be a feature of full of it industries like an offering where you guys are stewards of it i'm not going to choose how you do it but my source point says okay it just this needs to be maybe the title for something and this needs to be this to be resonant you know to be copacetic with the narrative i'm building on behalf of all of us but besides that it's all your call and your domain you know whatever it is like i think we would want to start with some agreement like that to see how it goes where so we're not really doing anything more than we need to do Because why would you want another gather room when you've already got one that needs to be designed? I need to finish designing mine. I'd rather have you guys help me finish designing mine, get that off the ground. You can hold your thing there. And now we're displaying co-creation as well. We could say like, we can basically say, and we're doing this with another friend, come to the conversation of conversations, a project by Chizzy, you know, in partnership with Synergy Works and Vibe Cafe. Everyone gets a little plug. Everyone's part of the jigsaw puzzle. Everyone's in their fast lane. Victor's doing tech. He's creating a container of containers. I'm really one of his first big clients, you would say, who I was like, yeah, I like what you're doing. Full of it industries needs a synergy, a synergy lounge. It needs a synergy works. It needs the super sex club upstairs where it's VIP only, right? So I'm going to create a whole world there. Yes, the jargon is not for everyone, but I still don't think right now we have to work get too caught up in that and synergy works is a nice name everyone likes synergy it says literally synergy works in the title <laughs> um the name actually comes from skunk works i don't know if you know in the 60s in like boeing and jpl they had something called skunk works skunk works were basically a blank check for the creatives to get on with what they needed to do in the basement in full creativity so synergy works is full of an industry's version of a skunk works um it's just working on livingry which is another Bucky Fuller term. So instead of weaponry, the key product of Synergy Works is making a livingry. And it's a livingry because it's a single innovation that's the sum total of many innovations. So it's both holistic, united, and autonomous. It's literally the holy grail of what they call tier two in spiral dynamics and getting past the green thing where everyone's the same and everyone has a vote to whole systems orientation and spirituality and channeling and systems theory that's what tier two is about in spiral dynamics it's a big leap actually and green is the last color of tier one for anyone listening it's kind of like thinking of karate or something like going from you know the six degree black belt to seventh degree black belt is a let's say that's a real big jump it's not just one belt i don't know karate enough but 
spiral dynamics basically works like that. There's two tiers and green is the height of the first tier. So breaking through the glass ceiling of green is a big deal and it hasn't happened on the planet at any scale yet. There's only individual people who have peak experiences of it, just like people have peak experience on psychedelics. But there's very few organized, there's really no organizations running in a tier two way, really. If I'm going to be honest, I don't believe there is. There's there's people running holocratic organizations, like self-management projects, but tier two, it's so powerful if you can run like a company, for lack of a better word, in a way that's aligned with spirit, as Melissa was talking about. It's a total game changer. And Full Living Industries is a for-profit, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. So we're the first first for-profit company in the history of, of, of history. <laughs> cool. Bye, well. Suzanne. <clears throat> well, it I was going to say, um, I think one of the uh, technologies that would move us forward are like personal assistants so that it, instead of everyone having to be for someone else's project, uh, when they have their own, uh, everyone gets like a helper. Yeah. And so that's why I don't believe AI is bad. I just think it needs more work. And you were saying it's hard. I don't think it's going to be too hard to make personal assistants. Uh, just say one where it's like uh, you ask it, like Google's kind of one where you ask and then it helps out. But yeah, I, I think that might be a, a like when those ideas to move everything forward. So that's that what I'm idea. doing. Yeah, that's what I'm doing with that local LLM. Basically, everyone can have their own local LLM on their own machine, really. First of all, it's not owned by like the company. It's their own agent, to be honest, just basically what you described. The issue right now is cost. So the company that's doing for me, it costs them a lot of money to like train it and hire people. So they're giving me a break right now. But really, I need to come up with a minimum as eventually in a few months, like 250 a month. Again, in the scheme of businesses and things to pay 250 a month, even for a personal assistant trainer that becomes part of a, a collective intelligence is not overly like we, we need to be able to figure out how to afford these things or inspire developers, obviously, Jamie, that's not always about money. I want to be clear about that. But also in the world we live in, that's part of the equation right now. Um, but I think we can answer that, um, Brittany. I think we have, and then the COASIS project that you saw is because it already is a decentralized type of project and it is incorporating AI, it already has the solution that you're talking about. It's just that it doesn't work yet fully. And that's a problem in software. It does not work easily and it's not, and hollow chains the same way, which is these other advanced kind of blockchains. Like we can use a regular blockchain potentially, but the real juice is in some of these other understandings of distributed technologies, which I'm praying and assuming just like me, that they have beautiful ideas that are meant to be in the world and they'll just arrive whenever they're meant to arrive. You know, um, I have to believe that there's a bigger thing happening and that everyone's playing their part. So. So, Brittany, there's a future solution to that, but there also is a more local potential, like within the year, working with this company I have in prototyping, like, you know, I might be able to add like LLMs to my LLM rather than them starting a whole new one. I might be able to add personal ones for all of us where you control it. Like you're the admin of yours, but it's part of like a network, you might say. So it's, it might be a win-win where it's like you can have a safe place for your own space and LLM, your own agent. Um, but it's kind of in my my platform as a holding space. Like until we had tons of money to pay these guys, like I'd, otherwise I don't know how to do it. Like they're giving me a really good break. Like they're giving me a few months to try to like get leverage and like see if I can find some investors or philanthropists or whatever, or create a revenue model. They're basically like gifting me like a few months um, to some degree, like of the opportunity as a kind of investment gamble, you know, on the fact that I can turn this into something. Yeah. Right. What we might do then is, you know, forget about the money for a second. Imagine each of us is able to do our own LLM and then our LLMs are able to interact. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, one way that this could really be monetized beautifully you know about github of course well i own the i own the domain name bothub.com 
and several people have expressed interest in buying it from me, but I haven't sold it yet. Imagine each of these LLMs lives on bothub.com, like it's it becomes the coolest place for bots to hang out on the internet, right? Yeah. And imagine an artwork, you could probably spin it where it's like, instead of a hot tub with people hanging out in the hot tub, it's it's bot hub where a bunch of bots are hanging out in a hot tub, like an oil bath, I like, that. like C-3PO. Yeah, it's yeah, like a good that. idea. Um, I think the crowdsourcing allows for that exponentiation uh, process where it builds off of each other. Um, that would mean a lot of people need to work on I, I think the starting point might be what people need in a bot before even creating one and that doesn't really cost any money you know to say what do you need and how it can do it that's a great starting point and then from there you don't really need much because you don't need to build out something in full you just need something that meets that uh need for that moment you know until you could keep working on better you know, you just work on the priorities first and then build it out fully with time. Right? Can yeah. you say that can you say that again, Brittany? Like the beginning part? Uh start with the priorities to meet the need uh as you're getting the rest done. Is that the part you were what, talking about? Can you just flesh that out a bit? Like which priorities for which need and how did it relate to the LL the AI? Like are you yeah, it's just, just like tell me a little bit more of a story. Go back a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's where um someone has needs uh help, you know, mm -hmm. like general help where you know it's kinda like Google with searches but for other stuff too. And then um they explain how like that personal assistant can help and then they would uh and then it something would be created for that just that part and then um, then you could build from there, you know, as that part's getting done, where it's helping out the people with the projects. You know, it's like if you have a project and then um, you could say what you need help with and then how, and then see a certain, it's usually like, you know, a service, you know, the uh, personal assistant bot is a service to, yeah. you know, uh, help out. And then everyone has a different, uh you know type of help that they need and then you just work on each one of those and get everyone's needs taken care of all the projects moved forward and then from there you combine it all together and then see what's missing and fill it in and whatever else is needed add i think we could do a version of that with the starting point llm that I'll be working with as a service, like you're saying, until we have the capacity, like you're saying, to like have everyone, like we've had revenue or some kind of token model where it allows us to actually offer, you know, for free, everyone to have their le legitimate, their own assistant. But I think we could probably leverage the index of conversations with the LLM, with the interface to at least have people do a search, like you're saying, or put in a need or request and see what they get back. Like, so we can do a version of that synergy engine thing that you saw on the on the Coasis page, but we can do it in a in a duct tape way, so people start having the experience of the connectivity of getting their needs met on some level. I mean, there'll be some more working shit out, but I think yeah, I think that's feasible what you described. Uh, you can make it like uh, you were saying software as a service, right? Well, I was calling mine story living as a service as a as an homage to the idea that you offer something like software, but in this case, it's quite, sort of like you know story so it's a it's but but so yeah, but story living as a service will be offered in a traditional way in terms of like x amount per month gets you this. There's a free version, whatever. Like I mean, I'm gonna try to avoid all that to be honest. I'm gonna try. I'm actually going to man. I'm I'm expecting to manifest basically a, a zillionaire at some point, so we can just basically give all this away because it's important to do that. Until the universe shows me that and it helps me do that, I'm just I'm going to stick with like I have to figure out how to do this 
on my own, like in a way, like it's part of my life story, my experience to actually be able to take care of my wife and like making it, I think it's a bigger story for me. Like actually it's part of my destiny to monetize it so I can then become the philanthropist that I'm looking for in the world. But be, but in as part of that journey, I'm definitely open to other possibilities, you know, or anyone who can support it. But my own personal like willpower is like, stop fucking around, figure out how to monetize your shit, make your money, hire your friends, give your money to everyone and be the philanthropist you want to see in the world. Because I already am that person, by the way, because evolutionary and spiritual philanthropy, as I've defined it, is about investing your whole self into into the field of consciousness in any way you can so everyone here does their time their skills their love their attention their money it's like money's cool it's one thing among many so i want to be clear when i talk about radical philanthropy it's the world view of philanthropy the love of humanity like unconditional you know no strings attached funding and for me my company unlike ai open ai or elon literally all the profits of my company will be reinvested in the Maslowian needs of people so that we may find the spaciousness to then build the world that we want to build. And that's as simple as that. And if Elon decided to do this tomorrow with Bezos, we would already have a different world in 24 hours. So, Jamin, there is a chance with the press conference, right? We can be crafty here. This is about magic, not reality. We could have a timeline within six to 12 months where actually Elon and Bezos or whoever, or J.K. Rowling is better. She's a billionaire. She's already a philanthropist and she's a woman. Um, Jennifer Lawrence, like there's people. And again, it's not just because I care about money. It's just a trim tab. Right now, money is a trim tab. If you gave me a billion dollars, I can tell you by tomorrow, the whole planet would have more hope. And hope is more important than solar panels. Or in my opinion right now, it's even more important than veganism and the climate. The first thing we need is the sense of hope on this planet, like when everyone was going to the moon. Eric Weinstein and Schmachtenberger talk about this. Like we've lost the innovation of America, for one thing. I'm from America, so I'll just speak about that. Like, you know, look at all the uh, hurricane and everything. There's no response. Clearly, it's all bankrupt. What kind of country was America when we don't already have hospitals waiting for people and we weren't able to bus everyone out? What the fuck has happened to America? Jesus Christ. There's people dying, there's hurricanes, and there's no food even ready. My friends are buying Starlink equipment to keep the medical doctors and pharmacies open, which is nice because now it's getting down to people. So there's a positive in that. People are learning self-coordination and everything. So there is a light at the end of that tunnel. But Jesus, if that doesn't tell you how bankrupt the country, you know, there's an illusion going on that we're all okay in America, as Jamin, you know better than I do. You know, the food supply, the energy supply are literally on a, the probably the most precarious thing that we can't even imagine, really. Like, it won't take much more of something, you know, to really potentially do something. So if we can cut that off quicker, hope would be the best way to start. So everyone on the planet had a rallying cry that's somehow connected to them. That's what M Melissa was saying, and I, I didn't get a chance to thank her, but I want, Jamie, make sure you tell her thank you for the reflection on the collages, like totally, totally what I do. And to know that like my creativity and, and heart is able to light up other other gates was a really nice compliment. So, um, and really, uh, really received well. Thank, tell her I said thank you. Um. I, I wanted to say, I think the way to make money would be um, once someone gets help that they need, then since time is money and you save them resources and everything, uh, they might be able to donate back, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course. Everyone is always thrilled to support that which has helped them. That's, I totally agree. It's a no brainer, but we don't require it. What you do is you teach people how to fish and you give them fish, in my opinion. I can't stand the idea of teaching people how to fish without also giving fish. Like if I have a thousand fish and someone's starving, I don't need to teach them how to fish right away. Like maybe I'll give them a bunch of fish first and then together we will figure out how to create a, a, a fishing resort or something. Let's welcome an extinction person. I love when I get challenges. Are we still trying as hard as we can to avoid the cooling topic? What's this guy selling? Let's find out. What are you selling, extinction? I know what I'm selling. I can tell you that. Oh, I have to. Oh, that's Brittany. Thanks, Good Brittany, for all, for all your feedback and all your heart. Yeah, thank you, Brittany. Anytime. I really try. All right. Uh, Thanks, thank Brittany. you, everyone. Mm -hmm. All right. Much appreciated.
And and Extinctionati, I, I did reach out to you verbally earlier in, in the meeting and you didn't respond. And I direct messaged you and you didn't respond. So I, I didn't realize you were even there today. I thought you just logged in and walked away. I also have to go in a few minutes. So cooling topic can definitely uh, come back online if that's also important to Extinctionati. And and maybe not directly, but but indirectly, everything we talked about will bring about the the eventual um, it, 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 it will get us to cooling the planet because we'll do the things that the planet needs in order to sustain. So, um, but I know uh, Extinctionati would like to be more direct, and we he, we have offered and, and accepted. You know, he wants to present uh, his own ideas and offer a breakout room, but. Uh, last week, you just kind of left without I, I, I in the beginning, I said, you know, let me know when you're ready to start the breakout room and you can go there and you you didn't, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> well, let's well maybe I can maybe I can be blunt about what I'm selling like Extinction Adi, Come on. Like you sound like you're kind of victim and like your mind tends to take a nap when no one else relates to the relevant. I mean, open up your mind and wake up a little bit. Then we're all here for the same reason. And we're all happy to receive your ideas, but apparently when you get asked to do that, you then disappear. So you have some responsibility, don't you? No, we're not all here. I mean, you're just kind of a peanut gallery person. Do you want to talk or do you want to just text in there? I guess you're only able to text. Is that the case? I mean, it's not very nice to tell people something's BS, really, but I'll, you know, I'll let that slide. This also relates to the green meme stuff I was talking about earlier. When you have an open container that has no rules other than inclusivity, you often find it very difficult to get anywhere as far as creating things because it's a very slippery slope. Unless it's only a healing space, like only an inclusive, only healing like focus, which is totally cool. But I think that has to be clear to some degree. And I think you've mixed that up a little bit sometimes, Jamin. I mean, I think your gift is inclusivity, by the way. So I fucking would never begrudge that. I think you're, and you and Marco, I mean, the same, like it's just amazing. And it's a function that can sometimes not deliver the other maybe pieces that you're interested in, like what you call action. Like, I'm going to be honest, not because, I mean, maybe I'm a dick or whatever, but, um, you know, that's just me giving like a professional opinion as someone who is actually an expert in social like, you know, organization and collaborative, co-creative, evolutionary, you know, things also as applied to sciences and things. So as Melissa said, my, 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 my painting with different colors includes like physics, science, psychology, you know, neuropsychology, creativity, mathematics, engineering, you know, marketing, advertising, filmmaking, literature. I'm kind of just a da Vinci that way. I mean, trust me, I still have to wake up four times a night to pee. So like my whole life is not like, I'm not some kind of Buddha. I'm just naming my actual like gift and skill set. You know what I mean? Um, it's about, if it's about drugs, please send me the names. I don't know what that means. I don't even know what, what, what the hell that's supposed to mean. <laughs> if it's about drugs, please send me the names. Yeah. Anyway, um, Jamin. Marco, think about gather. We can have another conversation, whether it's Friday, Tuesday, whatever, separately. Um, sit with it. There's no rush. Like, contemplate it. Talk to your guides. Talk to your wives. Talk to your priests. Uh, and and you know I'm here for you no matter what we decide anyway. Um, I can always come and share these updates and give my impressions. And I'm also trying to maximize, I think, importantly, like I said, I think it's really important for all of us to start maximizing our time that way. Um, not because we feel stressed, just because like that is nature's way is to optimize. That's what syntropy means compared to entropy. Nature's tendency to optimize and create whole systems of greater con uh, complexity, consciousness, and freedom. So I'm looking to always be more syntropic compared to entropic, which is 
basically breakdown entropy is like you know breaking down over time um which most people think it is the nature of physics but it's actually the opposite as we all know <laughs> like <laughs> things are getting better on some levels like just because a glass doesn't come back together that's the famous entropy example like a glass falls on the floor and they always ask why doesn't the glass leap back onto the table with all the water in it so because of that side of physics and reality they then extrapolate that that all of reality is basically entropic rather than well i've grown as a person i put myself back together right we're all doing that so clearly all of life is not entropic it's the physical matter side of life that's entropic but as an inverse as above so below some people say there's also syntropy because you can't have black without white as the Taoists would say so put that in your pipe and smoke it, uh, Extinction, and I'll see you next time. I love you. And yeah. I know Jamin will be more diplomatic and say something even nicer after I leave. <laughs> love you, Brett. <laughs> Thank you love so much. Love you guys. Much. Thank see you. See you later, Gandalf. Thanks. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Brett. It was great. Great we'll for you. Soon, Brett. Hey, thanks. Peace out. You can have what I'm smoking. I'll send you a copy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to start a new recording.